about the homework? Uh, you assign from 11 to 14, and on the book it's only 13 problems in the chapter. I don't know if there's something mismatching. Mm -hmm. um. Well, I guess it's just 13. Uh, I think what happened was I took, I remember deleting one problem that it was either duplicated or it was somehow inappropriate or I did it in class. Uh, I did it in the, in the, um, So I put the, I, uh, did you guys get an email from me? Yes. Did you get two or just one? I got two. <laughs> I got two about the same course and one about the homework. But the homework is a lot easier. I see. Okay. I'm never sure when I use, I'm never sure when whether the, University's email. When I click on email or class, something pops up, and it's what pops up is a strange window, and so I'm never, never quite sure whether it's the right thing or not. Um, let's see. I'm not sure of how much to repeat from last time. I know I want to repeat the Yang Mills stuff because it's really important to see that. Um, the other material, um, I think instead of repeating the other material, it's, it's uh, let me just mention a slightly different way of using uh, coherent states uh, to do both path integrals and, for that matter, to do solitons and instantons. Um, and let me illustrate it first for a scale field. So a scalar. And so you're integrating 
these are all at some time t. And in fact, the simplest thing is to set uh, just set uh, x0 equal to 0. In other words, t equals 0. And you define that as the displacement operator. Then um, what you can see, first of all, is that this is um, this is a unitary operator because the structure up here is a commission, uh, assuming phi prime is real and phi prime is real. And we have an I here. So, so you have D adjoint D is the identity operator. Um, secondly, this is a linear this thing, if you expand phi and pi in terms of annihilation and creation operators, this is a linear, an exponential of i times a Hermitian linear form in A and A dagger. And so it's d is of the form e to the i alpha a minus, uh, actually, it's actually alpha star A. Well, let me get this right. E to the, in fact, alpha A diga minus alpha star A. Um, and summed over the various Fourier modes. So in other words, if I use a discrete, a discrete uh, set of um, wave numbers, then it would, it would look like that. Equivalently, it would be e uh, to an integral of alpha of k, a dagger of k minus alpha star of k, uh, a of k, d cubed k. This is also an anti-hermission. This is e to an anti-hermission operator that's linear in A and A dagger as is that. The point is though that um, so alpha is alpha also? But that's just just a complex just a number. number. Alpha's a complex number. But doesn't it have has to be quadratic in, in the creation and annihilation operators from the fields? I mean you have to you multiply the fields there. Right. Oh, this is a function. Oh, That's right. a function. Okay. So this displacement operator, frankly, I should have written it like this as, to be really fancy, I should have written this as phi prime, phi prime. So it's a functional of two functions, phi prime and phi prime. And now, you can define coherent states then like this. And you can call this phi prime, phi prime. And then this state has the property that it's normalized.
now you can do something similar for, and, and all the, the coherent state formulas and automatics applies. You can also define something, a functional in terms of, um, I would say, just zeta and zeta star. And this would be an integral e v i. And now um, you would have, say, so, uh, sorry. Basically, uh, it depends. On, you can write it various ways, but you could simply say psi dagger zeta minus uh, zeta dagger uh, psi d q x. So this would be a way of doing um, uh, fermionic coherent states slightly differently from the way that I did it in class. I, what I gave in class was the conventional discussion. Uh, this might be a better way of doing it. This displacement down here, so you, you took one scalar field, the last line on this board, the one scalar field became uh, the, the scalar field in two different locations? Is that no, it's the same x, but it's but it's the scalar field is displaced by the function phi prime. Okay. What is like this? Is there a way to how how should I think of that? Like, like what's it's like two two fields at the same place, so it's they're either phi prime is a function. It doesn't have operators. Let me. Let, let, let me just give an example. Um, let's go to the simple case of. Let, let's just go to the simple case of one variable, and look in terms of the annihilation, annihilation creation operators. Then you have d of alpha, and then what you would have is a d of alpha the adjoint of alpha would be A plus alpha. And the same thing, the adjoint of alpha, A dagger, D of alpha would be A dagger plus alpha. Okay, so you want to see more of this, or should I just jump to? I see some puzzled expressions, so maybe I should uh, shall I derive this, for example? What? what uh, if you let's, bring, it's if you bring it up in the Let's look at it straightforward. Let's look at it infinitesimally. It would be phi of x times um, 1 plus i integral, what is it, phi pi prime minus pi pi prime d cubed x. And then on the other side, 1 minus i integral pi pi prime minus pi pi prime. Okay, so this is equal to phi of x uh, plus i commutator of phi of x with integral let's say phi of y, phi prime of y minus phi of y, phi prime of y, d q y. Okay? I've, I've done it in the infinitesimal case. In other words, where pi prime and phi prime are small. Well, um, phi at equal times commutes with itself. And so the only commutator is phi with pi. And phi of 
but let's just take everything at time zero. And by the way, I was thinking of this again at again x zero equals zero, the same time as in this definition. Um, okay, so now in this commutator we just have phi with phi is I delta, so we have plus I times a minus sign times an I integral of um, delta X minus Y, phi prime of Y, dq Y, and so this is phi of X plus And the same thing is true of um, if you put a pi in here, then you get d dagger pi prime pi prime pi of x t of pi prime pi prime is pi of x plus pi prime. All right. So as I said, this is a way of doing um, doing the uh, doing path integrals in terms of coherent states in a way that might be better. So now I propose to switch to um, Yang Mills theory. What I'm hoping to do is to latex this up and um, then you can read it. Any questions? In fact, the work people did ask questions and didn't get any chocolate, right? There was a question about the homework. Thanks. Did anybody else ask a question? Uh, Throw overhand and right hand in the more All right, so now I'm going to repeat what I did last time for um, the uh, Yang Mills uh, case. And um, the basic idea is slightly more general. It's uh, the idea of local symmetry. And so what you have is you have a vector of fields by one of x psi n of x, and you want to, you have a transformation that you want to be a symmetry transformation where G is an n by n matrix, n by n. And so what you want is you want the, the action density, also called Lagrange density, to be invariant under the symmetry transformation. And the problem that you encounter is that the action density has derivatives in it. And so the derivatives are going to act on the G as well as on the psi. And that causes um, problems. In other words, in the case of a Dirac case, you have gamma mu d mu psi. Now, if the transformation is psi prime of x equals g psi of x, where g is just an n by n matrix independent of space and time, then, in fact, this thing is invariant because this prime is just psi bar of x, if this is unitary, then this is g adjoint, which is g inverse, gamma mu d mu g psi, but the g goes through, and so you have psi dagger g adjoint g d slash psi, and this is psi bar d slash psi. So the thing is, when G does not, when the matrix 
doesn't depend on space-time, then structures like this are automatically invariant on the unitary transformation. And the problem occurs, though, when G depends upon it. Did we decide that G has to be unitary? Or? Great question. Um, I wrote a couple of papers on the case where G is not unitary. Um, when G, in other words, when the group is saying non-compact, and then if, if the group, group is compact, you can always find finite dimensional unitary representations. If the group is non-compact, then your representations are finite dimensional and non-unitary, or unitary and infinite dimensional. And since the field is a finite dimension, typically, then your matrices are non. Then what you need is you need to introduce a field that plays the role in internal symmetry space of the space-time metric in general relativity. This is discrete gauge, and it would, when it's a finite group, is that like a discrete, a discrete gauge? When, in other words, if if there was G, was if if there were elements or representatives. Of, uh, oh, if, they, if G were, say, n by n matrices that formed a finite group, yeah. I would find it hard for them to depend upon X because X is a continuous variable. And so as you change from one X to an infinitesimal neighbor, the thing would either have to stay the same or jump to one of the different finite group elements. So finite groups don't look as though they I was just thinking of like the discrete lattice type stuff, where you don't really, I guess, the space. You mean like lattice gauge thing? Is that yeah, what you're talking about? Yeah, where it's not really a it's continuous parameter anymore. Well, let's put it this way. In lattice gauge theory, what you do is you take a Yang Mills theory and you put it on a lattice to be able to, so you can approximate the functional integrals without, is ratios of functional integrals without. Integrating over continuously. Is that why they can use discrete groups in lattices, in lattice gauge theories? I don't, I don't know why you're, why you're using the word. Actually, you get a candy. Uh, like, uh, like, the Z, like the Z2. Say it again? Theory. Like a Z2 lattice gauge theory. Like what is, oh, that's, um, that's a different kettle of fish. Okay. <laughs> that's. Um, that's a case where you're, uh, you just decide that for physical reasons, Z2, or for simplicity, you, you have a Z2 as the, um, as the group elements, right? Um, anyway, here, that has nothing to do with the metric, in other words, that group. No, in any way, Z2 is compact. It is. All right, anyway, <laughs> let, let, let's, let's, these are wonderful questions, but let's get back to the main story, which is simple, solved, important, and really important to understand. Um, Okay, so you need a replacement for du. You need to turn that into something else. And it turns out you need to make it what's called a covariant derivative. And it's written as capital D mu. And sometimes one adds an x, which one should uh, essentially. So what we want is you see in this case, in the case in which G doesn't depend upon X, then D mu psi prime of X is just G D mu psi of X. So one simply has this this, this structure here, which is very simple. In other words, you can even put the prime on the outside. D mu psi of x prime is just g 
d mu psi of x. And that works because g doesn't depend upon space time. So now we want a more general case. We like d mu of x psi of x prime to equal g of x d mu of x psi of x. And so this is equal, of course, to d prime mu of x psi prime of x. And we want that to equal this. But we know what psi prime of x is, namely it's g of x psi of x. So now comparing the top line with the bottom line, we see that we'll be all right as long as d prime mu of x g of x is equal to g of x d mu of x. <clears throat> or equivalently, if I ought to really follow the notes of one more in here in the lecture. Um, if d prime mu of x is g of x d mu of x, the inverse. So d mu prime of x is g of x, d mu of x, g inverse of x. So this is really the, the, the key uh, equation in, in gauge theory. And what we do is we say let d mu of x be d mu of x. It's sufficient to do this. Let it be d mu plus a mu of x. And now, what, uh, what do we want? Well, we want d prime mu of x, which is d mu of x plus a prime mu of x, to equal d of x, d mu of x, g inverse of x, which is g of x, d mu plus mu of x, g inverse of x. And multiplying it out, what we get is the d mu can either act on g inverse or it can keep going, in which case it's d mu. The next term is g of x, d mu on g inverse of x. And maybe we we'll put an extra parenthesis to stop the d mu. And then the, next, the other term is g of x, a mu of x, g inverse of x. So now, comparing this expression with that expression, what we see is we want that a mu prime of x should equal g of x and mu of x, the inverse of x, plus g of x, the mu of x. Well, this is how, this is, this is what we need. In other words, you can find some a mu, which, of course, since g is an n by n matrix, this is an n by n matrix. And uh, if we find some n by n matrix and it transforms this way, then d mu will transform this way. And then d mu psi will transform this way. And so then we can have as our invariant something like psi bar gamma mu d mu of x. This can be the sort of, this can be part of the action density and it's invariant. 
where does the first term come from? The derivative by itself? In the line where in the in the last line where you're deriving the prime. Oh. Well we've got a derivative here. It's free to act on G inverse or on or it can just sit there as a derivative, act on anything to the right. In other words, this is a derivative, okay, and it has a derivative part that's acting on whatever is to the right. Yeah. And now they're originating to the right, but it's a different, so it's just a differential operator without yet anything to the left. Okay, so if I feel like it was acting on something. So in other words, we've got this derivative here. It acts on G inverse, and it's it's still a differential operator, so it can act to the right. But it has to also act on G inverse. Great question. I'll put these notes online. All right. Now, in a sense, really. Yangville's theory, non abelian gauge theory, this is basically it. I mean, there, this is the key idea. Everything else follows from this expression and this expression. The rest of it is just detail, which is either amusing or it's trudgery, depending on your point of view. But it's, this is the key insight. Once you have this, the rest of it is, is, is basically details. I mean, not that they're trivial, and in fact, some of them, when, when, you, when you do this in terms of half integrals and fixed engagements so of what, there are some so you said non, when non trivial G, insights. You said when G is non, non unitary, you can deal with it by. by G? Some, when G is non unitary, the the G, when G, you mean? Yeah, the G when it is non unitary, you said you could deal with it by adding some fields. That's right. So is it similar to these gauge fields? You just add them to these, or are those different? The thing is a little bit more similar. Let's see, I, I, I don't want to try to get into this immediately. Um, What you need, you see, is if you have this psi bar and then a d slash and a psi, and this g is now non-unitary, then you're going to have a g adjoint here. You arrange the covariant derivative to be such that this is psi bar g adjoint g d slash psi, psi, which you can arrange, and you need another structure which you could call rho. And rho then has to be such that rho prime g adjoint g equals rho. Now, it turns out that if you do do this, then well, I'm getting ahead of the story. But why not, why not, at the end of the lecture, why don't you ask this question again? Ask um, what, what happens to Rho? All right, let's go to the simplest. So these things are called local symmetries. They're called local shit. They're called local because G depends upon space time. Um, and the simplest local symmetry is just U1, where G of X is E V I theta of X. So this is U1. And this is what happens in electromagnetism. So now the, the gauge transformation is A V prime of X is e to the i theta, a mu of x, e to the minus i theta of x, plus e to the i theta, uh, 
of x d mu e to the minus sign theta of x. All right, well, this one's abelian though, right? This is abelian. And um, I'm thinking here classically, so this, there's no question about theta commuting with A, and in fact, even quantum mechanically, we don't normally think of this as a C number or as, as something that's not an operator. So this is equal then to A mu of X plus, now the derivative of this would be E to the I theta, uh, minus i d mu theta e to the minus i theta, and so this is just a mu of x minus i d mu theta of x. So this is a mu prime of x. So this is how an abelian gauge field transforms. Oh, uh, I was going to say something that. These are, called, these are called local symmetries because G depends upon X. They're also called gauge symmetries. And a, th a theory with a local symmetry is called the gauge theory. In this case, it's an abelian gauge theory. And this is electrodynamics. And in fact, what people like to say is that you see if you if you had a global symmetry, then the action density could simply be psi bar d slash psi. That would be simply quadratic and psi, no A, no interaction. So the Feynman diagram would just look like this. Okay. Now, because uh, if, if you want to have an, a be, the, the, the action density invariant under this local transformation, then this has to turn into psi bar d slash psi, which is psi bar gamma mu d mu plus a mu of x. of x Now we have an interaction. And so we have now this sort of a vertex. So the interaction comes from the requirement of local symmetry. And this seems to be true, frankly, and it's somewhat mysterious, but it seems to be true of all known fundamental theories. That is to say, all the interactions come from the requirement of local symmetry. This is like a lot stronger than, than this is much stronger than the like uh, Lorentz invariants and things like that, which are more global. Or right. Although let's not let's not um, let, 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 let's let's um, think about something namely general relativity, there you arrange to have invariance under local Lorentz transformations. And consequently, you have um, and gen under general coordinate transformations. And consequently, uh, you have the interaction of gravity. So it holds also for G bar. But there is Unfortunately, there's a difference between GR and ordinary non-abelian gauge theory, which are called, these are called internal symmetries. Internal because the G, the G fools around with and mixes up these indices, one through N. And so, it's called an internal symmetry. It's local, but it doesn't, it doesn't fool around with space-time. And, um, Whereas GR is exclusive for space time. And that distinction between the two, it's, it's kind of too bad that 
that they turn out to be um, so separate in our minds, but ought to be some more unified uh, treatment. So what about local Lorentz transformations in this case? Well, I'm not trying to do GR here. I'm no, just doing internal symmetries. Okay. But these should be invariant under local Lorentz transformations. Well, wait, if you make it invariant under local Lorentz transformations, then you're going to need effectively GR. In other words, this is, I mean, if you just have if you just have psi bar d slash psi, then this isn't invariant under local Lorentz transformations. It's only invariant under global Lorentz transformations. Because once again, when you have uh, a local Lorentz transformation, the derivative will hit the local Lorentz transformation. Yeah. You'll get the derivative of the parameters that determine the local Lorentz transformation. Yeah. And so what you need is you need to put in other shock absorbers, which in a sense play the role of this so in a sense, it's a, it's a similar idea. But why should this not be invariant under local local Lorentz transformation? Then? This? Yes. Yeah. Well, what, what do we mean by a local Lorentz transformation? We mean some L of x, psi of x, gamma mu, d mu, psi dagger of x, and it would be L inverse of x. So not only is it um, is this uh, local, but it's also not unitary. <coughs> and now the d mu hits the L as well as this. And so you need to promote d mu to something such as, I mean, we, in other words, so my d, level is that d mu. Independent of the local observer that you pick, I mean. I'm sorry, say that again. I mean, the local Lorentz transformation is just like picking a different observer or a different frame of well, I'm using the word local in a technical sense. Local here means that the Lorentz, that the, we want this it is structure to be, we want this structure to be invariant under transformations of the form. Psi prime of x is L of x, psi of x, where L is a Lorentz transformation, but it varies from space. It's a different Lorentz transformation yes. at each space time point. Yes. Okay. That requires that you do effectively the same thing as over here, namely d mu prime is L d mu L inverse. But now, these things have to do with Lorentz transformations as opposed to internal symmetry transformations. If you follow this true through, you wind up with general relativity. Or uh, the generalization of general relativity. General general. Huh? General general relativity. <laughs> All right. OK, we've sort of done the case then of um, of U1, right? And the, the, the important thing, well, the important thing is these two equations that I've inserted in the chart. All right, the next simplest case is for G of X to be in SU2. I owe you a couple of chocolates. Do you want them now? No, I think they're at the end. Huh? I think it's at the end. Right. So uh, the simplest case is if this is 2 by 2. Of course, there are n by n representations of this. OK, now, so we can say that g of x is e to the i, and it's going to be some theta a of x sigma a over 2. Or we can say this is e to the i theta dot sigma over 2, where theta depends upon x. Now, 
Now taking the derivative of this thing isn't really trivial. On the other hand, in the infinitesimal case, if theta of x is just epsilon of x, where epsilon is a tiny three vector, then g of x is 1 plus i epsilon dot sigma over 2, and g inverse of x is 1 minus i epsilon dot sigma over 2. And now d mu, g inverse of x, is just minus i sigma over 2 dot d mu of epsilon. So the thing we need to compute to see how it transforms is this thing here. Let me remind you, d mu prime of x then is g of x, d mu of x, g inverse of x, and so this is e to the i theta dot sigma over 2, d mu of x, e to the minus i theta dot sigma. Okay, so we can see how A transforms. But now what happens, what happens is, um, if, I mean, the, the, let's just say this, a mu prime of x is e to the i epsilon dot sigma over 2 a mu of x e to the minus i epsilon dot sigma over 2 plus e to the i epsilon dot sigma over 2 d mu e to the minus i epsilon dot sigma over 2. So this is how a mu transforms, whether epsilon is infinitesimal or not. When it's infinitesimal, then um, we see that this works out somewhat simply, namely 1 plus i epsilon dot sigma over 2 a mu 1 minus i epsilon dot sigma over 2 plus 1 plus i epsilon dot sigma over 2 minus i sigma over 2 dot d mu epsilon. So that's how it how it works and if we expand this what we get is um, A mu prime of x equals a mu of x plus i uh, epsilon a of x. Um, some, by the way, I, I often lapse into this sort of generalized Einstein invention. Einstein introduced, you know, like 100 years ago, perhaps probably more than 100 years ago now, the idea that you sum over repeated upper and lower indices. Well, it, these other indices occur so often that we, 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 we sum of them anyway. So this is, in other words, when I write something like this, I mean we sum over A. And A goes from 1 to 3, which is what we were saying here with this dot product. So there, these are the three Pauli matrices sigma. Um, so that's a commutator there. And then we have plus uh, epsilon A of X, sigma A, sigma B, now we have 4, D mu, epsilon B of X. So that's how this looks. And prime on that x. All right, well, it's pretty clear that a mu is supposed to be in the Lie algebra. In other words, it's a mu a 
times sigma a over 2. So it's, what we have is we have one gauge field for each of the generators of the gauge group. And so now, in this equation up here, we can replace a mu by this structure here, except that uh, over here we'll have a prime on the a. And so then we get the equation a prime a mu of a sigma a over 2 equals a a mu of x. I think maybe I was just to keep these, keep this looking a little bit simple, I'm going to suppress the um, x, even though, of course, the whole point of it was to be an x. But this is the way it looks. Summing over a. So then what we have here is i epsilon a, and then the commutator, sigma a over 2, sigma b uh, over 2, a b mu, plus, and then uh, epsilon a, sigma a, maybe I should write it this way, sigma b over 2, um, b mu, epsilon b. So that's that's the expression. Now, let's remember that the Pauli matrices, which are our favorite matrices, satisfy the product rule epsilon ABC sigma C. So sigma A sigma B is delta AB plus I epsilon ABC sigma C. Now, as usual, when I get to this point, I realize that I've chosen an unfortunate notation because we have an epsilon here and an epsilon there. Um, I could call this FABC, because that's what it is, but let's just live with it, okay? We've got one epsilon is the gauge group parameters, the other one is the Levi Chivita symbol. Okay, so this thing I guess sometimes we have classes here where all these chairs are necessary. Okay, so this is a A mu sigma A over 2 plus I epsilon A, epsilon A B C. Well, actually, there's an I, I times I is minus 1, so why don't we make this just a minus sign? Uh, sigma C over 2 A B mu. And then finally, over here, what we have is um, epsilon a d mu epsilon b over 4. And then this is going to be delta a b plus i epsilon a b c sigma c. Okay. So that's, that's that. And now, the trace of sigma a sigma b is 2 delta a b. And the trace of sigma c is 0. So the sigma matrices are traceless. And um, by this formula, it follows. In other words, I should have said this trace of c is 0. So when you take the trace of sigma a sigma b, you get, just get the trace of delta a b considered as a 2 by 2 matrix so that gives you. Um, the fact is that uh, if we had been doing SUN or some other compact Lie group, 
what we would have had is instead of a mu being the sigmas, a mu would be a mu a t a, and then these t a are traceless in the case of a uh, unitary um, representation of a so we'd still have a trace of TA equals zero, and the trace of TA, TB would be some constant times delta AB. That's how we write it. All right, well now if we take the trace, um, what we do is we take the trace of A prime A mu, sigma A over two, we multiply by sigma D over 2. And this gives us uh, 1 half A prime. Actually, let me just say that this was kind of dumb for me. The, uh, the extra 1 half there. So just multiply by sigma D, and this will give you A mu D. And so that is, then the right hand side, and we need to take the trace of all of this. In other words, the trace of a mu a sigma a over 2 minus um, epsilon a, epsilon a, b, c, a, b, mu, sigma c over 2 plus uh, a quarter delta A, B, plus I, epsilon A, B, C, sigma C, epsilon A, D, mu, epsilon B, this whole structure, well, parenthesis, have to take this trace, and um, it looks terrible, but of course it isn't. Why, why did we end up taking a trace? I think I missed it. Because it'll work. Okay. Great question, though. So let me get you back to some trouble right there. Well, what do you mean it'll work? It'll do what we want. So, in other words, we're trying to find this. By multiplying by sigma d and taking the trace, this orthogonality relation was a way of getting this. Okay. Right. So now we just have to compute what the right hand side is. Now, sigma d, d with sigma a, it's going to be delta a d over 2 plus an i epsilon a d e sigma e over 2, but the trace of sigma e is 0. So this just gives us uh, a mu a, the first term. The next term, similarly, it just pulls out a, uh, it says c equal to d. So this is minus epsilon a, epsilon a b c, a b mu, delta uh, CD. Then uh, the trace of delta AB times this, well that's just the trace of sigma D, that's zero. So then we just have this one, and we get plus I epsilon ABC delta CD over two, because there was a four here. Epsilon A, D mu, Epsilon B. Okay, so finally what we have then is A prime D mu is equal to A D mu minus Epsilon A B D 
KB U. Well, I guess epsilon A, maybe I should put that here. And then plus I uh, epsilon A B D epsilon A D mu epsilon B. Okay, but th this A epsilon is totally anti-symmetric, so you can rearrange the indices to suit what it was, uh, your own concept of beauty. And, um, but anyway, whatever it is, it's this, this is the equation. This tells us something. Uh, this is how, this is the effect of an infinitesimal gauge transformation on the, on the three gauge field. And um, if I put the x's back in, then this is minus epsilon. And so we notice it's for an infinitesimal gauge transformation, the main term is just what you started with because it's infinitesimal. Then you've got something that's linear in the parameters of the infinitesimal gauge transformation, in the structure constants, and in the gauge field. And then you have an inhomogeneous term that involves the structure constants and the product of the gauge field times the derivative of the, uh, of the structure constants. And in fact, if you go really to the limit in which uh, epsilon is infinitesimal, well, then you could drop this term and just keep this. So in fact, um, you can think of it that way. All right, now, uh, we learned something immediately from this, namely that if you are talking about a non-abelian gauge theory, you have nice simple equations if you use matrix notation. On the other hand, if you put in the components, you get complicated equations. In other words, the, the formula that this is this is, in matrix notation, much simpler. It's just A mu prime is G A mu G, let me get the right term here, plus G D mu G inverse. And, and I've even got that one there. So A mu of x is g of x, A mu of x, g inverse of x, g of x, d mu, d inverse of x. So in matrix notation, it's a rather simple and nice looking equation. And in fact, we can even write this slightly in a somewhat different way, an even more compact way. It's just d, g of x, d mu of x, So in matrix notation, things are simple. You put in the indices, and it, it expands a lot. Once we have something simple like d mu prime is g d mu g inverse, well then it's easy to make invariants. And in fact, psi bar d slash psi is one such invariant. This would be psi bar gamma mu d mu of x psi of x and now this looks like psi bar gamma mu d mu plus a mu of x psi of x okay so 
now what we see is that the requirement of symmetry once again has, has caused us to have interactions. Namely that we've got something with psi bar psi, but now with, with these gauge fields uh, in the middle there. And in particular, for the case of, of um, U1, it's just this, and this is just a single gauge field. For the case of um, SU2, then what we have is psi bar d slash psi is psi bar gamma mu d mu plus sigma a over 2 a mu a psi. So, and, and so this is the thing that you guys used in the homework problem a, a while ago. Um, and and uh, so if we expand this out and put in indices, then um, what, we, what we have is psi bar, say, B, gamma mu, D mu, sigma A, B, C over 2, A, A mu, psi, C. So the coupling is through the sigma A, B, C. And let's just, let me just come back over here. So let, let, let me correct this. When you multiply these two together, what did I do? I kept the term that was quadratic in epsilon and that was complicated and dropped the term that was linear in epsilon and simple. So that was archy dumb. So in other words, this, we go from here up here. Let's forget the term that's quadratic in epsilon and just keep this term. And so this is minus i, sorry about that, sigma over 2 dot d mu epsilon. So this is what I should have written. In other words, this times that. So now we've got something such that the change is always linear in epsilon. And so that's true then. Over here, it would be this term then would be or is minus i sigma over two dot d mu epsilon. So in terms of indices, it would be uh, sigma a epsilon a. And 
now when so there's no need to do the product, it's a much simpler structure. So let me fix all of this. Sorry. Well, this thing is so simple, you don't need to do anything. So sigma over T, D U, epsilon A. And now when we take the trace, we come over here and we have So this is minus i sigma a over 2 d mu epsilon a. And now we trace that with sigma d, and we get um, minus i uh, d mu epsilon d. And that's, that's the way it should be. So this is just Absurdly. So it's just very, very simple. Okay. Sorry, guys. But somebody should have called me on that. You always keep the leading term, especially when it's simple. So now we've got something that. I must say, when I, I, all right, so now we've got something that is nice and simple, and it looks like the abelian case. In other words, if we recover the abelian case by just saying there's only one value of d. Uh, consequently, this term is absent, and it's just minus i d mu epsilon d. The fact that we've got an i in there is uh, well, it's, it's what we had over here. Minus i d mu of theta. Here we have minus i d mu of, of a. Okay. So what does the other term tell us then? Hmm? What's the new term tell us then? Well, it's just that for, this is, it means that the gauge feels transform more simply than in my Mistaken calculation. In other words, it, it transforms. No, no, no. I mean the a new the new term relative to the abelian gauge theory. It's the same as in the abelian case. It's the same term. The uh, the epsilon a b d term. Yeah, instead of epsilon d. No, no I mean the, the middle term. Oh, the middle term is the one that comes from this. This is right, and. What you can see is that these are the structure constants. So you'd expect then that in, in general what you'd have is A prime D mu would be A D mu. And then this is minus epsilon A F A B C A F A B D A B mu and then minus i d mu epsilon d. So for a general non-abelian gauge theory with structure constants f a b d in this case, this is what it would look like. Do you, do you have the notion of structure constants if you're outside of the algebra or outside of the linear? No, I don't think so. You have, you have structure constants even when the group is not compact. But um, you have a complicated. I mean, you, you need a continuous group. But well, yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't. I, I've never heard of them for a finite group. But when you say, when you use the word structure constants, like you're the the structure. All right, all right. Let's let's review structure on this. If you, if you, but uh, this is covered in my online notes. Uh, you go to the chapter on group theory. Right. So suppose T A are the generators 
A equals one through, say, capital N. These are N by N matrices. Holy shit. Time. God. I'm sorry about that. TA commutator TB is I, FA, 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 BC, TC. These are the structure constants. Okay. You can see that it's anti-symmetric in A and B because of the structure of the commutator. It, uh, they can also be chosen, always be chosen to be totally anti-symmetric if the group is compact. Okay. All right, I'm sorry about going over, and I'm even sorrier about um, screwing up, but I guess the, the lesson is uh, um, you write something up. Check it.